from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to part three of Every Photo is a Story. I'm Christy Feinfield, reference librarian in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress. Historian Sam Waters and I are going to talk about the photographs as physical objects, focusing on how they were made. We've seen how Frances Benjamin Johnston, hand as the artist, resulted in a certain way of portraying her subject. What about the different ways that she presented her final photographs? Now is a good time to look from the artist to her work. So how were these black and white photographs and hand-colored lantern slides made? What goes into the work from start to finish? Knowing more about the physical objects will help us understand who Johnston is trying to serve or sell to, who her audience is, and how their interests influence the photographs. So Sam, let's talk a little bit, while we have one of Francis Benjamin Johnston's cameras on the table, a little bit about what went into taking the photographs, what kind of planning she had to do, that kind of thing. Well, we know because of much history written about the technology of photography that these kind of photographs took hours to mm. plan, that she could be in a garden for half a day and only take three or four photographs. Wow. A different experience for and, sure. <laughs> right, this is not the digital world. Right. And that meant that every single photograph had to be very carefully conceived mm. and thought about because she wasn't going to be invited back again. These were, you as the professional photographer, as friendly as you were with Mrs. James, <laughs> you were still just a hired hand. Right. And she um, spent a great deal of time planning each trip and the time of day and what materials she was going to use. And maybe what flowers were going to be in, in bloom in that garden. That's right. She only so. could photograph in certain periods of the year. And you have to think about that very carefully because uh, you can look at a photograph and you can assume she was there in August. But these gardens, um, because you, you know that some flowers bloom in August, mm -hmm. but never be fooled by this because mm -hmm. these very wealthy people were able to plant flowers that bl normally bloom for you and me mm -hmm. uh, and in August, <laughs> the and they folks. were blooming in June. Ah. Uh, so <laughs> you know, one of the important things, which I think always gets lost uh, in, in some of the thinking, is that it's very important chronology. Mm -hmm. You have to know the time and, mm -hmm. and, and the day, and, or if, if you can know the day, and really have a sense of this, because it's going to tell you something about what you're going to see in the photographs. And knowing that it took this much planning and effort and expense, I would assume, you can kind of give weight to each photo in a different way than maybe the 50 photos you could snap off today. That's right. I mean, if you are going to come on a photograph in the archive of Francis Benjamin Johnston, mm -hmm. you can pretty much guarantee, be guaranteed that um, they were very considered. And so she took the photos, we talked about this a little bit, she took them for a lot of different purposes. Um, she well, took them for clients, for example, right. but what are some of the ways, that, the reasons she took her photographs? Well, I think that's something uh, that I find with students uh, tend to forget because we come on the photograph and we just have our experience to the photograph. Mm -hmm. But there was always these, uh, there was always somebody um, for whom the photograph was made mm -hmm. or intended mm -hmm. uh, for. And in the case of Frances Benjamin Johnston, uh, uh, the, the one, the primary source of her income was publications, magazines, okay. and newspapers. So here's an example. This is an issue of Vogue from 1915, and those are her photographs of uh, the James that's, Garden. Well, some of her photographs. Some of hers, ah. Some of which, <laughs> some of, and you own, uh, in, in your collection, the library, there are several of these. <clears throat> she was also, um, a person who exhibited her photographs mm -hmm. because she thought of herself as an artist. She did not think of herself as a technician. She thought of herself as a creative force uh, for good in America, that she was going to show America what was beautiful and what was important. So she would have her photos in a gallery show. She would have it in a gallery show. She had very well known. Uh, she was the first person, for instance, to as a photographer to exhibit at the, uh, the, at the International Flower Show in New York, which was oh, a wow. very prestigious uh, um, annual exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a photographic uh, exhibition in an art gallery in New York. Wow. Uh, very prominent uh, painters uh, exhibited in this gallery yeah. and here she was as a photographer. Right, because so you said photography was still growing right. as an well, art at this point. photography was always in uh, struggle of photographers mm. to be considered as artists. 
and one the of the other ways. Mm -hmm. Well, the most important most for important. our purposes okay. are the lectures. Okay. Um, Johnston uh, carved out uh, a career for herself um, that as an authority, and the best way to mm. have done that uh, in that time was to become a lecturer. And she produced much, those lantern slides were produced and paid for by her, herself, oh, personally. For her lectures. For her lectures, yeah. So this is a great time to point out, um, we have a lantern slide projector, the kind of thing she would have used to give these lectures. And the often mentioned, not yet seen, lantern slide itself. So to give uh, everyone an idea of what we're talking about, this is what a lantern slide looks like. You can see the color and that it's on glass. So this is the kind of thing she could insert in a projector and show to a large audience. That's right. And that was her goal with she, her. She carried these slides around in a protective wood box and every single slide was slotted and they were organized uh, by lecture. Were you able to find that organization? Was that one of the challenges of the research? Um, we found <laughs> a fair amount of, about what the organization. Johnston, if the slides aren't labeled, you can imagine yeah. how much organization uh, she may or may not have had. Uh, she obviously yeah. uh, knew herself how, what she wanted to show. Mm -hmm. She just didn't keep records of all well, of that. Well, who came to her lectures? What, what kind of audiences did, did she have for those? Well, if you remember in the last video, mm -hmm. we talked about the Garden Club of America, founded okay. in 1913. And this was her primary this is a ready client. audience. These okay. were, these were very wealthy people in America, women who got together and they made it their business to basically a green America after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they were going to go and uh, into city parks and highways mm -hmm. and prisons and churchyards as well as their own backyards and backyards of their friends and this was what Johnston was hired to photograph was those gardens to show people who came to these audiences, which were three and four hundred people. Mm, there were wow. over three thousand members of the Garden Club of America across the country, and she lectured largely to those groups. So when you mentioned before she's uh, photographing for clients, that's the other purpose, or one of her other purposes, was people commissioned her to come photograph their gardens. Right. People, li these ladies in the Garden Club, and maybe the Garden Club itself, would commission her. Well, the Garden Club was always members. Always and the members, members always paid for things. So the members, in this case, were estate owners. Mm -hmm. So the estate owners would uh, commission Johnston to come and photograph, like Mrs. James uh, would photograph and say, please come and f show me your garden. Um, show me, uh, come and see my garden, and I want to show other members and also uh, the readers of Vogue magazine, who were all her <laughs> friends, uh, I want to show you what a beautiful garden I have, and I'm going to hire Francis Benjamin Johnston to do that. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about the lantern slide itself. Um, we talked about how she would show it to people, but how did it come to be? When I showed it earlier, you can see that it has color. And we talked about the difference between the fact that these slides have color and the photos were black and white. So how did that come to be? And what was the implication. If we look at a slide of the blue garden with this vibrant blue pool, is that really what that pool looked like? Well, let's, we have to hold on always that, so you had Mrs. James who wanted her garden photographed, mm -hmm. and you had the professional photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston. And you can ask the question, which is, why did they hire Francis Benjamin Johnston? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to hire Francis Benjamin Johnston because they think she's good at photographs. Okay. But what did that mean? Mm -hmm. What that meant when you are a hired hand is that you gave the owner the photographs that that owner wanted. And, what, let's, and if we focus on Francis Benjamin Johnston at the James Garden, mm -hmm. we look at this slide of the blue pool. Right. Now, let's look at that photograph very carefully. And you think, um, when do you really imagine a pool is that blue? Clouds in slides are always imaginary because they couldn't really photograph that. Right. They're painted in. Mm -hmm. And that meant that somebody created this slide. They made yeah. the pool bluer. Mm -hmm. And we know that Johnston hired um, actually had a, a very long relationship uh, professionally with a woman who lived in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and hand-painted slides. Oh. And Johnston would give instructions as to what that slide was supposed to look like okay. because she would have been told by Mrs. James, I want you to show my pool blue, right? And we have this interesting uh, photograph, I think you yeah, have well, to pull it out. Here, here's an example of a garden in, in California and um, it's black and white, 
And on the back of this photograph, I think this is the one, mm -hmm. right? Um, you see notes. And what in Francis Benjamin Johnston's hand, uh, she says, beautiful distance, live oak. But turn the photograph around again. And I think it's very hard to tell what's beautiful in the distance. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite certain uh, what's about that live oak because mm -hmm. it's hard to find hard it in the photograph. Mm -hmm. However, what those instructions were the instructions that she gave the slide artist to make this slide that you see here. So she would hand paint an image this size. That size. By these instructions. They would create. take this photograph, they would reproduce it mm -hmm. in a positive form on a piece of glass, and she would send the glass to the slide artist with the print mm. and the instructions. But the slide artist had to imagine what did that garden look like. And so she has to work on those instructions and her experience as a painter to make the garden come alive. So she would even tell her what colors to paint the flowers, oh, that kind of thing, right? And if you look at these, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in another uh, video, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, how, how those instructions were and what that meant to color them. And here okay. we have, I think we have another interesting pair, mm -hmm. uh, which is we're back to the blue garden. Right. And if you look at those pairs, the one on the left, um, is a slide that didn't get finally made but got mm. painted and the one on the right because we can see the black frame we know that this is the finished slide that Johnson showed to audiences okay. and if you compare these two right. note that one is much more purple and much uh, greener mm -hmm. and the other one has been muted and is more balanced in its use of color so why is that what mm -hmm. was that you always have to ask that question so she was able to really shape the final product. These were paintings, not photos, right. in some ways. They were paintings. Yeah. Um, they were, uh, it was completely her decision as to how this was supposed to look. And remember that she's always got the, the in this case, Mrs. James, mm -hmm. who's going to want her garden to look a certain way. And she would have discussed that with Mrs. James. She sells Mrs. James uh, several dozen uh, lantern slides. Okay. She sells her prints. She sells her hand-painted uh, photographs. Wow. And so what are you going to do? You're not going to send Mrs. James, oh, I'm going to send you the pool and it's going to be pink. <laughs> You're going to send it. It's a blue it. garden. <laughs> it's a blue garden and I want it really blue, right? And that's what the slide artist would have done for her. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I think now is a good time to kind of recap uh, what we've learned. So we have several top tips for learning about how the photographs were made, which are you need to identify characteristics of the original photographic objects. For example, the size. What kind of time and money was invested in making the photo? What influence did a camera or film technology have on the final image? Think about what happens after the photograph is taken. What can or did the photographer do to the image when developing it, cropping it, adding or changing colors? Ask yourself who the audience for the photos is and how their expectations of what makes a good photo might have influenced a photographer's work. Please visit the website for Every Photo is a Story to find tools that will help you identify different types of photography. The Try It Yourself exercise can help sharpen your eye too. In the next part, we will explore the photographer's era and see how the world around a photographer can affect her work. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.